If your views on other things can be predicted from your views on one thing, you need to be very careful that you're not in the grip of an ideology. Your opinions are too highly correlated with each other, and that's suspicious. That's Kevin Kelly. On his 68th birthday, he wrote down things that he wished he had learned earlier in life. When these aphorisms were posted online, they went viral. On this episode of The Knowledge Project, Shane and Kevin discuss the stories behind those insights. found that I could make a habit out of something by reducing the idea of it to a little capsule. The next bit of advice that I love, which is don't measure your life with someone else's ruler. <laughs> Tell me the backstory to this one. I've been waiting a decade or more to talk to you. Ever since I first came across your thousand true fans, I was like, oh my God, I want to talk to this guy. Where I want to start today is on your 68th birthday, you wrote down 68 bits of advice for your adult children about what you wish you had known. I want to die. I read all of your advice across 68, 69, 70. I want to dive into some of this advice and go to the stories behind them that created this sort of pithy wisdom that you espouse. And so let's start with learn how to learn from those you disagree with or even offend you. See if you can find the truth in what they believe. So, so just to back up, the general, the general thing of what I was doing was in, in a curious way, I was writing these bits of advice for myself in the sense that I – found that I could make a habit out of something by reducing the idea of it to a little capsule and give it a handle so I could repeat it to myself. I could remind myself of it. And so I wanted some way to take a lot of big, weighty, large advice and reduce it into a proverb that I could repeat. And um, so that's sort of the origins. I was kind of doing that in my head. Uh, I would hear something and, and I would repeat it to me to remind myself of it. And so these ca- things have their origin in a sense of like, did they work for me? Do they work for me first? And then I can pass, and then this idea of what I should pass it on. So the, the, the second element of this was, um, I have three kids. They're all kind of adult now. And um, we were not a family that gave a lot of advice or my wife and I were not preachy. I don't, I very rarely ever would give my kids advice. I was of the old school that said, the kids don't listen to what they, what you say. They just watch what you do. So we try to model the behavior that we wanted. But as I got older, I also realized that some of these little things that I was working on, I wished I had known earlier. I, you know, it took me kind of 70 years to kind of arrive at them. It's like, you know, if I'd had this little thing, that I kind of have in my own head now earlier, it would be so much better. So I decided to try and write them down for that and and give them as a present to um, my kids. And so, um, so when I'm doing that, when I'm trying to write down, I'm, I'm thinking of, of, of a way to kind of encapsulate a lot of information and advice and wisdom into a little tiny, device that I can hold on to. I think this is an important distinction that I get a lot of times online. You probably get too. This isn't about precision. This is about utility. Right. Exactly. Right. This is practicality. This is so, so, so I have several filters. I, I, I think through this one is like, you know, do I really believe this? This is something that I think is really works. And then secondly, is it practical? Does it, is it actionable? Can would it change how I do the, my day? And thirdly, was was um, I'm, I'm trying to um, following my own advice, uplift and be positive as much as possible. And so, um, so yes, so 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 giving advice is a really is a really tough assignment because it's obvious that it just varies tremendously on the context of who it is and what the situation is and so trying to give a general advice 
is definitely not about precision. It's about a general, what I call direction. It's about kind of um, moving in the right direction. And so, um, so back to this particular one on um, trying to learn from others that you disagree with and maybe even find offensive is, um, I'm, I, I guess I'm been surprised in my own life to find that people that I really fundamentally disagree with could say something <laughs> that I found was, well, yeah, that's true. Like, I, I remember I remember myself coming around to agree with Dick Cheney about something. And um, what Dick Cheney said was the um, climate change environmentally was not about personal virtue that had to be changed at the systems level. I was like, yeah, that's right. You know, Dick, here I am, I'm agreeing with Dick Cheney because he had, you know, something to say that was that was true. And so um, we're not obligated to like everybody. I, I, I feel no duty to have to like everybody. But I feel that there is some duty to kind of respect people in a certain sense. And, and this, this idea of kind of respecting someone that you don't like and disagree with, it's, it's, it's difficult, but for me, it pays off, is, I guess what I'm saying. There's a practical benefit for doing so. Do you feel a need to be liked by other people? Um, I think everybody has some element where they need to be liked. Um, but I, and, and so yes, I would like to be liked by everybody. I also realize that that's not really so, so, so emotionally, yes. Intellectually, I understand that that's not going to happen. And um, one of the curious things, and this is, I don't think I wrote, I wrote this down, but this is something I've learned over time, is that um, with enough numbers, with an audience of enough numbers, um, no matter what it is you do, somebody will not like it. And, and vice versa, like this, take I have this book of advice, there's 450. When you ask people their favorite one, the best ones, there's no agreement on the best ones. I, you know, everybody's list of the favorite ones is, there's, none, there's no overlap. And so I, I, I think part of what I've learned is that there's going to be people who, some people who don't like what you do all the time, but they're not going to be the same people. And when I was running a magazine uh, called Coevolution and Whole Earth Review, I was the editor, and we kind of ran a little maybe provocative kind of articles. And my goal was to piss off one fifth of the audience, but keep rotating it, make sure it wasn't the same <laughs> one fifth. <laughs> you know, just just like everybody gets your turn to be to be riled, and so. Um, and so that's the kind of idea is is that um, y y yes, you, 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 I'm not going to be liked by everybody, but I don't want to kind of be a predictable <laughs> liking. I, you, you know, I like that. It's it, with your reach. It's like you're the mayor of New York, right? Like not everybody's <laughs> going to be happy right. all the time with what you're doing. I like the idea of rotating the unhappiness, sharing yes. it equally. Exactly, An equal opportunity. <laughs> disruptor so um so yes so so that's you know by the way this is one of my bits of advice um it's, it's allied with that which is that um um if your if your views on other things can be predicted from your views on one thing you need to be very careful that you're not in the grip of an uh, ideologue but that's what it is it, it, it means that you your your opinions are too highly correlated with each other, and that's suspicious because most people are much more complicated. If you're really genuine, you're going to be much more complicated than that. And, and also, by the way, this is a new piece of advice. Um, if you're unpredictable in that way, you're much less likely to be um, taken over by an AI. <laughs> you, you, you want to live your life in a way that the AI cannot predict what you're going to do, that it cannot kind of fake you or cannot in some ways, um, which are where they want, um, imitate you. 
go deeper on that a little bit in terms so, of AI so, and disruption about how you think. Yeah. So, so, so there's a lot of concern about artists and even writers about training an AI to produce work, to generate work, to creative work. And there, the concern is, is well, you know, uh, my material that I've worked really hard for has been used to train this AI and people can use it to imitate me. And sometimes those imitations are quite amazing. But really what you want to be able to do is to have a style, so to speak, to have something that's hard to predict, mm. that's um, that's unpredictable, that's Im- 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 imitable, that you, you, that you can't be imitated. And this, again, goes back to my other piece of advice about don't aim to be the best, uh, aim to be the only. So if you are in this category that it's hard to imitate you, that's a that's a really good place to be in the human world and also a really good place to be in the AI world because AIs will have difficulty in imitating you. I think I'm in trouble. My kids went into chat GG or GPT <laughs> the other day and they, they drafted this email and why should, they should get like more video game time, but they did it in the style of Shane Parrish. Yeah. So they basically like, it was an email from myself to me. <laughs> And I was like, this sounds awfully familiar. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what was your what was your query here? And yeah. they were like, uh, draft an email to dad about yeah. uh, in the style of Shane Parrish. I was like, oh my god, this is in tr- I'm in trouble. Yes, yes. Um, so, so yeah. So you 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 if you were if that was hard to do, then you have an advantage because your your yeah. job is not going to be taken by an AI. Um, and so um, and so the idea is is to not be so predictable yeah. in the sense, particularly again, if you have, if your views on the environment can be deduced from your views on religion or something, that's going to be, that means that you're yeah. kind of not really that much of an independent thinker. And that's going to become more valuable because AI, at least at first is going to give away, uh, standard thinking for free. So it'll exactly. raise the bar for some people, but it'll be so conventional for independent and original thinkers. Right, exactly. Right now, the best way to think of these AIs, the, the chat training, the, LL, the LLMs, is that they're um, they're the epitome of um, wisdom of the crowd. Yes, okay. Okay, they're wisdom of the crowd thinking. It's, that's what it is. It's a collective, all the average people in the world and all their average foibles and all the average genius. And it's going to get a very kind of average thing that is often very correct, but oftentimes not because it's the average. And so, um, it, it, so it's, the, it's the wisdom of the crowd AI, um, which is really good <laughs> if that's where you want to be. Um, but, and, and actually... I have, you know, I've been trying to figure out the practical use of these things and how people are actually using them. So I have a friend who runs a very, very popular blog site, and he uses them to help them write headlines. And sometimes he used to have uh, did the, did the, to write a punchline at the end. And he said it's often very generic, and he has to kind of push them. To be snarky, he'll say, "No, no, no, make it more snarky." Or pretend you're a snarky editor, or pretend that you're right. a conspiracy. You know, have to kind of push them to not be that standard average. Deliberately say, "No, you need a little bit um, on a little fringier. You've got to be a little bit angrier. You've got to be um, something." And then the role play more provocative. And so, if you don't do that, you're gonna get the kind of as you said. The standard average. I want to come back to AI a little later because I think we'll have a broader conversation on it. I want to go to the next piece of advice that sort of stood out as I was reading these, which is always demand a deadline because it weeds out the extraneous and the ordinary. A deadline prevents you from trying to make it perfect. So you have to make it different. Different is better. It is, right? Different is better. <clears throat> um, yeah. so, so, so deadlines... This, again, it took me a long time to kind of figure out that I needed deadlines and deadlines were the difference between, you know, a, a dream and a something that you complete. And um, 
what happens with deadlines for me anyway is you've got a ship you're you're you you have to abandon the project and um it's not perfect oh my gosh it's not perfect but because it's not perfect you kind of have to be ingenious about making a little different and that and and, and i find that deadlines force me to make decisions that you know that you 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 don't have enough time. You never have enough time, um, and so you 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 think of something to. I wouldn't say it's a shortcut. You think of a way to finish it, and that little those little decisions are what make it a little different. W- w- one of the shocks to me about um, working a Wired on a monthly magazine was every single issue, after years and years and years, was a miracle that it got done on time. It was like you would think it would come down to some, some formula, and you just you'd be done on Friday afternoon. <laughs> you know, go. But no, it was it was this last second getting it out the door every single time, and part of that was because we kind of kept upping the the goal, the quality. We, you know, we're, we're we're trying to make it better than last time, and so you come down to the same thing where you are being driven by the deadline to try to excel but not making it perfect by by, by, by doing something a little differently than you did before. Because without a deadline, you can convince yourself that you can always make it a little bit better, but then you never ship. Right. How do you find that balance between in a world of leverage, right? Like where an internet article can go viral and reach 100 million people or it can reach 10 people. How do you find that point at which I've done enough, I'm comfortable with this versus the trade-off of do I raise the bar? Do I make this better? What is the advantage to doing that? So there's a couple of things, a couple of bits of advice buried in a book about that. One is this rule, which was actually based on some research uh, in various different um, fields of life that when you trying to optimize something versus trying to explore where, where you, you have something that works and you just want to make it kind of better and go, you know, and optimize it versus doing the inefficient thing of going out to try and try something new. And it comes down to something like when you go out to eat at a restaurant, do you get your favorite thing that you know works or do you try yeah. something that is a new dish that may not work? And so the ratio is actually one to three, two to three, one to three. So you you actually want to spend um, two thirds of your time trying to optimize things that you want to go deeper and better, and then a third trying trying new things. And that's been shown in many many ways to, to be roughly true. So that's one answer. Is yes, lots of times you're going to just try and make it really really better and not think, but a third of the time you want to be taking a chance. So. Um, so yeah, so I think um, the second thing is this idea that um, I learned from doing art, and that is is that um, there was actually a book called Writer's Time about how to write a book, and it, and it said that basically, look, the, the 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 amount of work to write a book is infinite. It's just bottomless. It just could go on and on. And that's true of almost any project in terms of perfecting. It's bottomless. So really, the only thing you control is your time. You say, I have this much time to give to it. I'm going to do the very, very best in this amount of time. And that's sort of what a deadline's about. It's saying like, yeah, I mean, it could go on forever, but but I have a deadline, so I'm going to do the best. I'm going to write the best book I can in a year or a year and a half, whatever it is. Or I'm going to do the best podcast I can make in a week. And so... That is a deadline, and what it's doing is it's giving you some way to control because you can't control the amount of work, which is infinite because you always can find some way to perfect it. So, so this is the idea that you control things by controlling the time. I wonder if, if part of us is hiding behind fear too. We don't want the deadline because we actually don't want to put the work out there. We can convince ourselves that hiding, you know, making it better, hiding behind this perfection 
is in and of itself work <laughs> and that we're accomplishing something. We yeah. don't have to put it out in the world and get feedback. Yeah. And right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, that's that, that's true because it's not good enough yet. Yeah. Um, and and there's uh, I, one of the things I have become um, a really big proponent of, which is you know doing things on a regular basis. So the advantage of someone like you doing a podcast on a regular basis, like if this one's a complete flop, that's okay. Tomorrow you have another one. We'll try again. And you just do it over and over again, and you put out whatever it is that you do. You, you know, you're trying your very best, but you know that 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 there's more from where that's come from, and that gives you some kind of freedom to fail in a certain yeah. sense because I'm going to do it again. And that's true of making art, which I do every day. I make a piece of art every every day. So I'm going to put it out no matter what, and if it isn't up to the best standards, that's okay because tomorrow I'm going to do it again. And that's true about writing or anything else is this, this idea that you want to do things on a regular basis because that is the source of great stuff, but also gives you that confidence and liberty to put out something that's not quite the best and not get really hung up on it because wait, we're going to do it again. You get another at bat, you get another crack right. at it. Right. The next piece of advice I want to talk about is when you forgive others, they may not notice, but you will heal. Forgiveness is not something we do for others. It's a gift to ourselves. Mm -hmm. That one's profound. I found that the easier I was to forgive, <laughs> the better I felt. It's, it's sort of, it's like this, it's, it's like, you know, a lot of the golden rules are this weird, weird thing that don't make any logical sense at all. But happens, the universe somehow seems to be constructed this way. So, yeah, so like if the, the most selfish thing you can do is to forgive other people, the most selfish thing you can do is to give money away, the most selfish thing you can do is to help other people and you'll be, you know, you'll get. It's like that's weird, but that seems to be how the universe is set up. There's this kind of paradox at, the, at its core, and that's all of these principles are, are somewhat based on the same weird logic of the universe, which is, yes, the most selfish thing you could do is to be selfless. <laughs> you know, this is kind of weird. It, it goes almost to, to our biological instinct towards group survival, if you will, right? Yep. Where you're supposed to sacrifice for the good of your species. Y yes, I think, I mean, I think there are probably evolutionary reasons why that works um and but it's so reliable yeah that i i i'm just guessing that there's some other larger reason because um i can you, you can count on it i mean it's 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 um it's weirdly it's really reliable are, are there times when you've learned not to forgive and it's best to uh, move on without forgiveness? I haven't seen that. Forgiveness is sort of a way of, uh, there's another piece of advice of kind of accepting the apology you're never going to get. Hmm. Right? You're, you're not going to get the apology. You just sort of, in your mind, you accept it. And it's like, I, I think there has to be some, some kind of closure so that it's not. Because no. often we're waiting, we're waiting for that, right? We're waiting for the apology. We're waiting for the other person to yeah. go first. Right. We're waiting for the world to give us sort of what we want, and yet right. we're incapable of going first. Right. So, so that's what forgiveness is: is you accept the apology you're not going to get. The ne the next bit of advice that I love, which is don't measure your life with someone else's ruler. <laughs> yeah. Tell me the yeah. backstory to this one. Um. I've had the privilege of knowing a lot of, maybe I would say, um, accomplished people, successful people, famous people, super rich people. And man, they just don't look like that. The outsides not represent their insides. And we tend to want to compare ourselves to their outsides. And to how they are, to their own ideas of what success is. This goes back to 
don't aim to be the best, aim to be the only. I, I, I think we're, I, I'm better and I do better when I am not trying to imitate someone else's success state and how they define success. And um, so, so my, I mean, in a certain way, what you want to do is you want to kind of grow your own metric for what you, what would be successful for you. And that is hard to do because we're kind of bombarded with images and suggestions about what would make a successful person. But if you talk to people who seem to have success, you realize that you want to have a different <laughs> metric. Um, and um, I, I spent some time with the Amish, a lot of time with the Amish. It was really interesting because they had a very different measure of success. For the Amish, what they're trying to use, tech, one of the reasons, how, how one of the ways that they decide which technology they're going to use or not use is they have a very clear idea of success. And so their goal, their goal is to have a lot of kids and to have every meal with their kids until they leave, leave home. They want to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner with them every day. And if they can arrange their lives to do that, there's a couple other things, but if they can arrange their lives to do that, that is that is success. And so they spend a lot of time and a lot of routines and rigmarole and crazy stuff with their, their hacking to try and do that. But that's for them. It's like, oh, that's interesting. That's for them. That's a successful person is they were able to do that. And everybody in the community really kind of honors that. And wow, that's really good. So it was like, all right, that's interesting. That's, that's a different measure. We all have sort of like our own measure of what success is and what we think it is. And in a world of Instagram, what we're seeing is the best successes from everybody else. And then we're feeling less about our own self yeah. in part because maybe that ruler uh, that we're using is sort of a malleable in a way. It's like, well, I want... I want Kevin Kelly's brain and I want this person's body yeah, and I want right. this person's vacations and I want this person's <laughs> cars. And right, but right, this right. is what you're exposed to every day. You're yeah, exposed to yeah. the best of everybody else right, in a right, way right, that right. you never were before. Yeah. Um, it, it, it actually, that's an interesting statement because there's, because I think it goes even further and, 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 and I don't think we have really absorbed this and here's the furtherness and it kind of is beyond TikTok into YouTube. We see, the superlative of everything. We see the best human achievement of like, you know, the people who can use count cups or the Rubik's Cube speed serves or people jumping off of snowboard down houses. It's just the weirdest stuff of human achievement. We're seeing it. And so we have, we're being exposed to the superlative world. We're seeing lightning strikes, striking people. It's like things that we would, Never see, it's not ordinary, but we're seeing this extreme superlative version of the world, which does several things. One is it kind of can inspire us to say, well, that's, I didn't know that was possible for humans to do. I want to do something that level. That's great. But of course, at the same time, there's this other thing of like, well, my life is nothing like that. I must not be worth very much. So there's two sides to it. But I think there is a positive side to that which is to, 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 to see and appreciate kind of the full range of human potential for the first time. And, and, and that can be inspiring as well. The extraordinary has become ordinary in yeah, some ways. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Every, and, and it's like we're seeing it all day long. We're seeing the extraordinary all day long. It's like how that must affect us in some way yeah. that we don't really appreciate where I can see the best that's ever happened again and again and again. And, and the weirdness is, and you know, it's kind of like, um, I mean, actually, <laughs> I actually subscribed to a channel that just shows these weird accidents, coincidences, just the strange stuff every day that people get on their, on their phones and security cameras. And like, you kind of realize, you know, it's, it's like, um, you know, there's, I don't know, there's like, 
100,000 airplane flights every day, and then almost every day there's some airline mishap that we wouldn't normally even think about. But if you see that, you think, oh, this is actually not that rare. Yeah. I mean, it's rare, <laughs> but, but you – this idea of the extraordinary becoming the ordinary is, I think, a very profound thing that we haven't really absorbed yet. So with, with your thinking of success, I have to ask, what is success for you? Mm. I, I, I ask that in a slightly different way in my own vocabulary, which, which I, I ask other people is, what, do, what am I trying to optimize? And what I'm trying to optimize is um, learning for myself and increasing other people learning in the collective learning of the world. And I'm also, to my own advice, I, I, I'm aiming so that on the day before I die, I can say I fully become myself. And I want to help that for everybody else. Is that I want as many people in the world to be able to say on the day before they die, I have fully become myself. And in my mind, that requires tools and stuff around us to allow. So, so the story that I like to tell is just to do the thought experiment of imagining Mozart being born 2,000 years before he was born, before they invented pianos or symphonies, and the way that his genius would have been lost. We would not have... He, you know, maybe he could play some drums or whatever was around, but it would not have, we would not have had his genius exposed that way and illuminated and fulfilled. So we needed to invent those technologies of pianos and stuff. And so Van Gogh, before there was oil paint, what a loss that would have been. Or George Lucas, before we invented cinematography. <laughs> What a loss that would have been. So that means that there is a Shakespeare today alive in the world. And she's waiting for us to invent the tools that she needs to best express her genius. And so I think we have a moral obligation to kind of make stuff so that everybody born and unborn would be able to express their genius. And that stuff includes things like clean water and education and stuff. It's not just technology, it's cultural stuff. But we, we have it, and that we want. I want to unleash that in myself and others, and that's sort of what I'm trying to optimize. Love that; it's beautiful. I love the word "unleash" too. There's unleashing human potential um, by creating equal opportunity and creating better tools so that people's potential can shine through. Yeah, yeah, and, and we, you know, we're all a different mix. Each one of us has a different face. We have a different personality face. We have a different talent face and um uh we each have our own genius i truly believe that and so um uh what we want to do is arrange things so that you can arrive somewhere where you can actually express it and and i have to say that this is a very very difficult thing it 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 it's taken me most of my life to kind of figure out what i'm really good at and I think most people, it just takes almost their entire life to kind of figure out where their genius is. There are some occasionally prodigies of people who have a very clear idea when they're very young exactly what it is. But for most people, we need our lives to kind of figure out what our lives are really about. And the other important part of that is we absolutely need everybody around us. We need parents, we need friends, we need colleagues, we need customers, we need clients to help us see who we're becoming, who we should be, because it is really, really almost impossible to do that introspectively by ourselves. Yeah, it's hard to understand a system that you're a part of. You need those outside people pointing at your blind spots in a way, and you need to listen to them when yeah. they're right and ignore them when they're wrong. Which That's is... another piece of advice is that, yeah, you want to be able to um, uh, never quit. And then when it's quit, when good, it's right, right, right. But quit when it's necessary and you need your friends and family and everyone else to help you decide between yeah. those two. So you need some wisdom there. And I think, um, yeah, so it's, it's, 
th- that's why we've been put here with other people around us is that we really do need others to help help us become who we should be i love that beautiful again it's about the group i like that there's a common theme here well one of your other pieces of advice was you can't reason someone out of a notion <laughs> that they didn't reason themselves into yeah 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 i yeah trying to argue i mean th- this is something i have learned to not do is 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 argue with people even though i like to argue um but you have to you know you have to find someone who's arguingly authentically you're wanting to learn just and for lots of people that's not really the case and so um often we have things that we believe that we inherit or that we don't know why we believe or we certainly haven't arrived through logic and so therefore logic is not going to, to work um, another piece of advice i have about changing people's minds is i have found by far the best way to have any hope of changing someone's mind is to try and listen and understand truly understand why they think what they're thinking how they got there and that conversation will often give you the position to say something honest that might help them move the otherwise it's not going to to work um because you were kind of operating at that point and more emotionally at the emotional level of having a conversation rather than uh, a intellectual reasoning um, option nobody's rational from the way that they see the world yeah. it's all about how do they see the world what, what would the world have to look like for me to exhibit that behavior or that belief Right, and, and that goes a long way to helping you understand how other people see it, because nobody's intentionally uh, acting irrationally. Right, and everybody believes, and also, by the way, they also believe that they're good and doing good yeah. things. And that's another piece of advice: is that in my in my view, and this again took me a long time to kind of realize this, but in my view, the worst crimes against humanity have all been done in trying to eliminate evil. And so the lesson to me is like if you are in a business of trying to eliminate evil, you've got to be really careful because that's where that's where most of the harm happens with people trying to eliminate evil. Politics and, is full of that. Yeah, exactly right. So so I'm really wary of anybody left or right who's trying to eliminate evil in the world or the bad things or whatever. So because most of the really bad things are done in that name. The next piece of advice I want to talk about is a great way to understand yourself is to seriously reflect on everything you find irritating in others. Yeah. What's the story behind that one? I think we're kind of, we're really sensitized. It's kind of like a self-criticism. We're really sensitized to the things. I'm, I'm not sure what the mechanism is. I don't have a deep, understanding of that but it's just my observation is that um things that you know there's something fundamental about things that really tick us off and it's because it's like the resonant frequency it's because we're sort of operating in a very similar frequency and so um we become sensitized to that and we find it annoying but it's actually because it's something that we are revolving around in some ways. I'm not saying that, you know, if you find someone lying, it means that you're a liar. It just means that there's some fundamental thing about telling the truth or whatever that is really core to you, and you need to look at it to be sure about your own behavior in that department. Yeah, I, I, I think that there's a lot of, um, there's a signal in our body when other people are doing something that irritates us that's a part of ourself right. that we don't, we don't like. Right. And, and that's where we're getting that signal from. Yeah, yeah exactly. The, the, the next, I only want to do a couple more of these and then we'll, we'll switch to sort of broader topics. But the next one is whenever you have a choice between being right or being kind, be kind with no exceptions and don't confuse kindness 
with weakness. Yeah, and, and by the way, you know, the, the sub-theme of the book, throughout the whole book, is about kindness, compassion, gratitude, these kind of elemental, timeless, ancient virtues. Um, so kindness is a kind of compassion. Um, and it goes back to, the, again, this, for me, in this kind of the weird paradox of the universe that... Um, Kindness is not weakness because, in fact, it's a strength. It's 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 power. It's weak people, small people are unkind. You, you can be generous when you are confident and true and honest, and so um, and so cultivating kindness is um, is you're cultivating a superpower, and so. It, 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 it's it's this kind of this again this really weird thing that um, reaching out helping others is the most selfish thing you can do in the long term. So it's a little bit of long termism, and that's another thing that goes through is this idea that yeah, for immediate payback, you know, be angry, be snarky, whatever it is. But if you are patient, if you take the long view of your own life and what we're doing. It's very clear that, that, that you'll gain more in that way. So you can afford to be kind, give away something, mm-hmm. give away your time, be humble, give away your own status, whatever it is. Because what I've seen among myself and other people is that you'll be rewarded more. So, so it's kind of like there's a, there's a reason to do it just on the base of it of, of being human but i'm saying no no it's the most practical selfish thing you could possibly do i, I love the idea of the long view because it, it it's a frame that changes everything right? right so if you take a long view to life you eliminate a lot of negative behavior right. but if you even remind yourself before you talk to somebody at work or a colleague and you just think i'm gonna have a relationship with this person for 20 years it changes the conversation you're about to have with them, especially if you're upset with them, because now you're like, oh, I'm going to approach this almost like I would my partner right. instead of a colleague that is disposable or transactional, or right. I'm going to approach this as we're going to be working together for a long time. Here's this thing that's bothering me. How do we get this out of the way so we can keep going forward versus like, stop doing this. This is, you know, it right. just changes the notion of the conversation and that it- allows for compounding. So if we look at sort of like, one of the major, major forces in the world that people don't take advantage of. It's compounding. Right. But what? how does a relationship compound? Well, it yep. compounds over time, but you need to stay on the timeline. So anything right. that you do that negates being in a long-term relationship takes you off compounding to begin with. So if you think long-term and you know from compounding that all the advantages come at the end, not at right. the beginning... They're very right. slow to accrue, but then they're too large to ignore. Right. It's right. like how do I how do I be in a relationship with this person for twenty years? Right. And that compounding gives you again the freedom. It unleashes you because it will overcome all kind of temporary setbacks. Right. I mean, yeah. the thing we know about investing is, yeah, if you're there for a long time, then things can go up. There could be recessions coming and going, and you're not bothered by them because you're taking longer view so because those gains in the end will overwhelm even fairly large setbacks and so yeah. if you say okay this yeah we have a set you know we're we're we have an argument or whatever it is but in the long view it's okay because the gains of that are going to overwhelm whatever losses we had along the way and or mistakes too i mean you can make that's the other thing is you can make mistakes even fairly large mistakes but if you had a long view the total gains outweigh them. So, so it's it's um, and that's and we're we're talking about personal relationships, but it's also true about civilizations and societies. Yeah. And um, this is, of course, my involvement with the Long Now Foundation, trying to promote this idea of doing generational things, um, because one, we have ourselves benefited from what previous generations have made, but it also allows us to um, to do things that are maybe even riskier. Um, now, because we we will we will make mistakes, but the long term games of taking a longer view and arising our our horizon um, will give us greater gains if we if we do that. 
Okay, last piece of advice before we move on, which is before you are old, attend as many funerals as you can bear and listen. Nobody talks about the departed's achievements. The only thing people will remember is what kind of person you were while you were achieving. So that came from my attending funerals. It was just a 100% direct observation of the data where I was going to... um, funerals and i was noticing this weird thing and you know then you kind of play forward it's like what are people going to say at my funeral and um it's uh it was really sobering um to to reflect on that and um there was you know a couple people who were prominent and i was just kind of maybe shocked or amazed that that's what people wanted to talk about was what they were like and what they did and their sense of humor and all these other things. And it wasn't about the trophies that they had at all or what they had even accomplished. And so that was for me like a wake up call. It's like, mm, okay. Um, yeah. What are people going to say at my funeral? And um, I, I, you know, I, 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 uh, I understand that it's going to be about the quality of my character. So, um, so that means that I should focus a little bit more on my character development and growth in my character, necess- rather than you know another certificate and another. Thing to brag about. I think that's so important. If you if you sort of close your eyes and do a thought experiment and imagine yourself at you know a hundred lying in a hospital bed with a few hours to live, and you look back on your life, you're not going to think about you know how many Twitter followers you had, yeah. how much money's <laughs> in your bank account. You're going to think about was I there for the people I cared for? Yeah. How yeah. was I as a person? Mm-hmm. Right. All the moments where you where you chose to be unkind and you could have been kind. Those are the things you're going to think about. Was I there for my kids? Did I skip the meals? Did I work extra to get that promotion that I now realize suddenly Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't matter, right? What matters is time with my kids and my family. And yeah. 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 So they're all, they're all, a lot of these vices are all kind of woven together. I know you said that this was the last one, but you know, one of my pieces of advice is, you know, spend, half as much money on your kids as you think you need to and twice as much time because that's what they're going to they're going to value and um yeah we we um that's the idea of again that's another technique people call self distancing that's really good about this which is imagining yourself a future self looking back or imagining yourself old and looking back and seeing what um you would do now to to change things and i think um re, you might rearrange your your priorities um which is sort of i did over time again i wish i had known this earlier so yeah. putting it all together in this little book hope you enjoy I, it i i love that i think like you're just trying to get a different perspective onto your own life you don't yeah. have to like we look back at like i look back anyway at what i did when i was 16 i was like oh that was profoundly stupid <laughs> my 16 year old self did not think that was stupid but we can use this sort of time shifting to give ourselves a different perspective into our own lives. It, exactly right. Yeah. So, yeah, this kind of zooming around with time is a very important tool that, um, again, I, I, I use and I would encourage others to, to play with. I, I want to come back to something we started talking about a little bit earlier, which is artificial intelligence. Why are you so excited about AI and what do you fear about AI? We humans are incredibly opaque to ourselves. We don't know how we work. We don't know how our brains work. We don't know what consciousness is. We don't know what intelligence is. We don't know what humans are. And the major way that we're going to find out about who we are is through AI and robots. As we tend to try to make them like us and not like us. And How do we have other kinds of thinking, and all these things are going to come back. And then 
in addition to that, making other and trying to replicate ourselves is is that um, we're also going to use them to come to become better humans. So it's like one of the things going on right now is you have these language models and chat bots that are trained on all human writing and behavior, and we're kind of we're shocked that they're racist and ageist and sexist when that's kind of like the average human. But here's the thing is we don't accept that. We're saying, no, they need to be better than us. This thing, this thing that we're making cannot be racist, cannot be sexist. It has to be better than we are, which we can code in because that's just code. Ethics and morality is code. We can put it in. But the problem is, is that we don't have any idea or consensus on what it means to be better than us. We don't know what a better human looks like. We don't, we don't have that in our head. We don't know. We don't know what a, a ethic. Our own ethics as humans are very shallow and inconsistent and terribly vague. But we want a, robots to be better than us. But we don't have a picture in our head of how to do that. So we are now going to be using these AIs and robots to imagine, articulate, and help us become better humans. So that's why I'm excited, is, is, is that it's going to help us become better humans. What does that mean? We don't know. That's, that's the conversation we're having right now. Every day we're, we're coming up with these things. Like how, what, what does better than us look like? That is an incredibly profound question. How does our own brains work? We don't know, but we're going to be finding out because we're trying to make them think and be conscious. So this is a huge centuries long identity crisis centuries long you know a journey for us of understanding us and then trying to change ourselves and that's that's why it's so exciting so we can talk more about that and then to your question but what am i afraid of well i'm sure so the more powerful the technology, the more powerfully it can be abused. This is the most powerful technology we've ever made. It will be abused. I'm sorry to say it will probably be used, it will be weaponized. And um, those are always something to worry about. So um, I'm not worried about the kind of commercialization and stuff. I, I go along with uh, Ted Chang's idea that most of our worries about technology are really worries about capitalism. Um, I am worried about the weaponization of these things, and I have a second worry, which is a little harder to explain, which is um, I'm, a f I'm worried about whether we will take on the, the relationship with some of these of master-slave. And treat Wait, them like double slaves. click on that. If we treat them like slaves, that's incredibly corrosive to our own humanity. Okay, just 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 that stance, just the stance of these are these are going to do our bidding. They're just machines. They, um, you know, we can treat them. Help, help me understand um, that, because that's a different relationship than I feel like we have with computers right now. Well, it, it is. And, and, and one of the things that we're trying to figure out is what is that relationship? And so uh, I, one of the things I'll say about the chats is that they are the universal intern. That's what we're making. We're making these universal interns that do all the work of interns. And you have to check their work, but they're kind of like doing first drafts and they're helping research. And so that's a relationship that we can understand. And that's a... You know, it's there's still a power thing, but it's okay. It's a, it, it's not degenerative like I think a master-slave relationship would be. So, um, we, I don't, I don't see any evidence that we're going down that way. But that's a worry that we would, and that, and, and to some people, they're just machines. And I'm saying, no, no, just that the stance itself. It doesn't matter that they're machines. If we have that kind of, we're just You'll do my bidding no matter what. I don't, I'm not going to. You're not human, so therefore, 
I can have you do whatever I want it to do. So, um, so that's a worry that we would do that, although I don't see any evidence that we're doing that so far. What would be the signs that AI has been being weaponized? How would we know? Oh, oh, oh. Well, there's all different levels of it. There's, in a curious way, because this may seem contradictory, in a curious way, um, you know, there's this idea that take humans out of the kill decision. So you have uh, robots, soldiers, drones that make, that autonomously decide whether to fire the, the gun or not i actually am okay with that in a weird way because one is i think we i think it's possible that we could make them better than us and so they don't do war crimes so they're actually so we have the rules of war which is a weird concept but it's better than not having rules of war and that we kind of say okay these are going to follow it and so they do follow it my hope is is that w- that process of doing that, we realize how absurd it is to have war. Because right now we're saying, no, no, we don't want robots killing people. We only want humans to kill other people. <laughs> it's like, that's not... No, no, we don't want humans to kill people either. And so I think, I think by having to write the laws of war for the robot soldiers, it will illuminate how screwed up the idea of, of accepting war as, as a legitimate um, um, process. So, wait, so, wait. so that's so that's that's part of it. Yeah. I, I want to explore that a little more because in my mind where I go with this is like uh, not every country would agree to encode that into all of their devices. Mm-hmm. The country that defects would gain an advantage, but the AIs would also learn that not everybody's following the rules of war and then it would autonomously adapt to not following them because like, am I thinking about this wrong? Well, the, the one thing I, I feel is I have a huge disagreement with the single Aridans because I don't believe AI is ever going to be out of our control in the sense of, yes, I mean, there, there may be occasions when it does something, but we're going to be quick to, to correct it and say, no, no, so, so if there's if there's people you know, or countries that don't uh, that are having soldiers that fight the other way, it'd be like having war crimes. Mm. It's like, yeah, do does the rest of the world accept that? Are we going to? Are they going to be punished? So, so um, the thing about the world that we're headed into is is that for better or worse, we're heading into a global world, and this idea that we're going to stop globalism or stop the globalists, it's 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 like we're not going to become Amish. We're not going backwards. We are making an integrated world. And the more the complex technology we make, like the internet and what's ever coming next, is very, very complex. It requires thousands and thousands of people to cooperate, to make it work. And even the AI running, it's not, it's very. The, the the fantasy, the Hollywood fantasy of the lone villain on the mountaintop who has all this technology that works. And there's no there's no <laughs> IT support. It just works the first time, and they can gain control of these very complicated. That's just that's just that's just it's like dragons. It's it's uh, it's just a fantasy. There's the only the technologies that we're making today, the more powerful ones, just require so many people to buy into the vision to make it work and keep it going that um, there's a, there's, there's a natural resistance now that's going to come. So, so to, to get something accepted, you have to have millions of people, millions of people buy into the vision. And so there are, you know, and, and there are things we bought into without knowing it. You know, we, we there's all kinds of things that we have, that we're collectively supporting without having articulated them. But, the important thing is, is that it takes huge buy-in to make things happen today. And that's a conservative force in the classical sense of it. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I don't worry too much about these rogue ideas of things. Yes, there may be an occasional thing, but there, it's not really a, 
a, a force at work in the world. Do, do you think we're at the hockey stick inflection point of AI finally? I mean, we've been talking about AI for 20 years. No, I don't. I, I, I think we're still at day one. And um, so here's the thing about AI, artificial intelligence, is, is that most people think of um, intelligence, including a lot of AI researchers, as a single dimension, like a decibels, hmm. IQ. It's multidimensional. There's multivectors. It's all gradient. None of it's binary. There's 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 probably hundreds of different dimensions and different types of cognition in our own minds. And um, so far, we've synthesized basically two varieties: pattern recognition and a little bit of kind of generative ability. There's this lo logical deduction. Um, you know, symbolic reason. None of these things have we come close to synthesizing. What's shocking to us is how far we can go with just these two things. We've and then and they're, and they're very flat and kind of bottom up into this connectionist idea, which is like yeah. And what I've learned from that is that that bottom up will take you much further than you thought you could go, but will never take you all the way. To where you want to go. So Wikipedia, this classic bottom-up thing, over time, there's a more and more top-down editorial control, and eventually, over time, there will be even more to get where we want, to get that kind of encyclopedia that's totally reliable, that does what we want to do. There's going to be some more top-down control given to that bottom-up power but you can't get all the way just from the bottom up and that's sort of what the neural nets are they're they're, they're very flat bottom up but and they're going to take us much further than we ever thought but they're nowhere they're not going to take us to where we want to get to one of my fears i think with ai that we'll have to deal with at some point is that the news isn't the news anymore the news is tailored to me and by tailored to me i mean you and i can look at the same article which is generated in real time based on our political preference based on how much coffee we had in the morning it's going to have enough information to tailor the article towards us in a way that uh, can manipulate or mislead or engage or drive clicks or, or do whatever and we'll have no way of telling what the actual news is because we'll all have an individual view into the news yeah. tailored to our... Yeah, uh, so, so I think this epistemological front that we've um, entered into is a very significant and very potent frontier, which is um, how do we know things? How, yeah. What do we need to be convinced something is true? Right. Again, we've kind of like in our own past sort of waved our hands and thought, oh, I know, I know. But what this is coming up to illuminate is, in fact, we don't know. We, we, we don't really have a very scientific measurement for that or, or process. And so what this is illuminating is like, okay, ChatGP is making things up. Well, what would we, what would we need to believe that? Right. Is it... The source, well, can we believe the source? How, how many levels? Do we need to go on three levels of footnotes? Or does it need seven levels? Or do they have to be verified by something, uh, some other AI? So so this, this issue, I think, is a really fundamental thing. It's not a trivial thing of, like, disinformation for the election. No, no, it goes way beyond that. This is, this is a really core thing at the level of, what is truth? How do we? It's a consensus of some sort. Well, how do we come to that consensus? And what do we? What's? What are diff, the different categories? Maybe there's different categories of things. You know, there's maybe levels or varieties. I don't know. And th and, and that's very exciting because we're going to have to head into that to kind of decide. Um, and it's not a matter of something Facebook is going to figure out. This is a big, big challenge. Is how do we know things, which was begun by the scientific method. The scientific method began to change 
how we decided we knew things. But that's, so I did a study of the scientific method. I did the first study of the scientific method. And then what I realized is a lot of the things that we consider essential to the scientific method were very recent. The double blind study mm. was like in the 1950s. Placebos yep. were not invented until within my lifetime. And so um, the scientific method itself is changing very, very rapidly. And so I'm trying to imagine what's the scientific method going to look like in another 50 years. And I think part of what's happening is that it's going to have an AI component and all these other things. But how we know things has been changing, and we're in this process right now of kind of being now illuminated the fact that we're in this thing. We're, we're changing how we decide we know things. And that's very, very exciting and scary. Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be fascinating to watch all this play out. Uh, I want to switch gears just a little bit because I wanted to hit on this before before we end. We talked a little bit earlier about religion. I'm curious what role you see religion playing in society today and how that might evolve in the future. I am myself. I have a religious belief. I, I, I think that um, if we look at the evidence right now, it's pretty clear that Organized religions are on the wane. They're just they're, they're disappearing around the world. The U.S. is almost exceptional in the sense that it's a very modern, uh, has a high living standard and a high religiosity, which is mm -hmm. very, very uh, unique. One of the things I can say about Christianity is um, all the countries that have gone atheist were Christians first. So Christianity is the closest thing to atheism. <laughs> it's, really <strange. laughs> it's, really, it's really strange um so um so i think i so i would say uh, standing back there are several things you can say about Christ, about religion one is there's going to be less of the current organized versions of them and secondly the other pattern we see is the schism where where, where, where even the organized ones become more finely divided and different little local niches so it's kind of like mass nitrification that we see in other parts of the culture i am going to i would not be surprised to see some new religions based on ai come up oh wait you gotta you gotta double click on that one religions have always been about um people throughout history people have converted and gravitated to religions that they felt made them more powerful or more successful. I mean, like, look at Korea. Korea went from a kind of a semi-Buddhist to a Christian state because it was being driven by the people that they saw who were Christian who were successful and like, I want to be like them. Or or your gods are more powerful than my gods. That was a, That was a very common thing in the in the ancient world was whose god was more powerful and people who were successful believing these gods it was like yeah i want that so i'm going to i'm going to um worship that god because i want to be like them and that's that, that's been one of the major causes it? It's not not this i i mean we think there's oh, some intellectual thing all of the theology sounds better but generally it has not operated that way it's been much more, I want to be like that person. What do they believe? There's, so, there's a lot of encoded ancient wisdom in religion, though, that yes. is beneficial to create success. It, exactly, right, right. So in the modern world, yeah, if, if, if you don't drink and don't womanize around and stuff and you are a family man, you're probably going to be more successful than somebody else. And so, yeah, I want to be that. I want to be that, you know, I want to be the Islamic guy because um, that's what um, because they were they all were more successful because of, because of their beliefs. You know, again, if you some of the things in my book about you know kindness and compassion and gratitude are ancient ancient wisdom of the religions, and in my observation, people who believe that do better. So yes, so there is a lot of encoded wisdom in the religions um but the other stuff about them are, is not working as well and i think there could be um a new some new powers from people who 
kind of dive into AI. Maybe AI helps them understand who they are better. Maybe they can become more themselves by using AI. And that therefore there could be something, not Scientology, but that's one hint at that kind of a thing. Imagine if Scientology really worked, right? I mean, you know, the, the gizmo stuff. Well, that would be, you know, a lot of people could move into that. And so I think, um, so, so it would not surprise me to, to, to see some new religions based around AI emerging in the kind of vacuum of the waning of the established religions. And, and, and let me say one last thing. And I would expect it to see these first in China and maybe Russia. Why those countries? Because they have a total vacuum of this. So, so, so here's the thing about China, which I spend a lot of time in. There are, there's nothing to believe in. They don't have a religion to believe in. They don't have a scripture. They don't have a constitution that they believe in. There's only about making money, and they and that's not enough. And so they, there is this hunger for something to believe in. And if there was something like an AI religion that could sweep the country because of the vacuum of, you know, something greater than themselves to believe in. I think we miss the fact that as humans, we have this instinct to be a part of something larger than ourselves. Yeah. And when that instinct is not fulfilled, it leads to all sorts of unpredictable behavior. Right, right, right. Exactly. So in absence of that, so nationalism is something bigger than yourself to believe in. And so that's why there's going to be a rise in China of nationalism. That's sort of almost inevitable because that's bigger than yourself and yeah. you can believe in that. It's your team, um, China. So, um, but there could be even bigger, bigger things. And that's, um, yeah, you want to believe in your, your, your purpose in life should suit you, but your meaning in life, your passion should suit you, but your purpose and meaning should exceed you, should be bigger than you. And, um, uh, we, we, we crave that individually. And so therefore, um, you know, we, we want to sign up. We want to be part of a big story, an arc going through it. For me, that big story is technology and, the, and life. I, I see technology as a extension of the same process of, of life in the mind. And so for me, the big arc is this sort of what I call exotropic growth of planets forming and life forming and then minds forming and then technology forming that's all one long arc through the universe and so that's what i'm aligned or that's what i'm trying to align myself with is a bigger story of bringing choices and possibilities to everybody so that everybody has a chance to um, fulfill or be the most full of themselves as possible that's a beautiful place to end this conversation thank you so much kevin